Welcome to all of you. This a special activity today. We have a special colloquium. The speaker today is Ian Agel from the University of uh, Berkeley. <coughs> He's giving a talk, talk uh, a colloquium on the virtual fiber and conjecture. So before he starts, I would like to say some words about uh, Ian. Um, <coughs> he has been at the University of California since 2007. His main research areas are in the topology and geometry of three-dimensional manifolds. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, he was educated, if I understand it correctly, in San Diego, the University of San Diego, uh, uh, and then before that in Caltech. And uh, he's the winner of a number of grants and awards, including the Oswald Veblen Prize in Geometry, Miller Professor in the fall of 2012, Senior Berwick Prize at the London Mathematical Society, Simon Sabbatical Fellowship, Clay Research Award, etc. Well, very recently, Professor Eagle is the recipient of the 2016 Breakthrough Prize in Mathematics which, as you know, is the, probably the most generous prize in, 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 in fundamental science, in mathematics and physics. And uh, as a great gesture, which I think fits very well with uh, the ICTP mission, uh, uh, Professor Egel has uh, donated a percentage of that uh, prize to promote uh, mathematicians from developing countries. So and I think that's a, it's a good gesture that we, we all appreciate from, from the uh, developing countries' perspective. So, so let's uh, welcome Professor Eagle. Thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot for the introduction and for the invitation to speak here. It's been a, a great um, conference this week. <clears throat> so um, today I, I want to talk about um, the, the, this virtual fibering conjecture, um, but my, um, I, I wasn't quite sure um, the audience's background, so um, most of the talk I'm going to spend um, sort of on uh, definitions and, and uh, background in topology and um, hopefully some examples to give you an idea of, of what's out there. Um, <clears throat> so um, the, um, w one of my uh, postdoctoral mentors, William Thurston, um, in, in 1982 he had a, a an article in the Bolton and American Mathematical Society that um, sort of gave an outline of his um, uh, viewpoint on three-dimensional manifolds and topology and sort of revolutionary ideas. And um, at, the, at the end of the paper, he had a list of 24 questions which um, have ended up being quite influential in the, in the field over the past uh, 30 years or so. Um, so the, the goal of the talk is to um, focus on one of, the, one of the questions from this list. And um, question number 18, so um, he says, does every hyperbolic three manifold have a finite sheeted cover which fibers of the circle? This dubious sounding question seems to have a definite chance for a positive answer. So um, obviously as a question, over time it's been um, sort of upgraded to a conjecture called the um, Thurston's virtual fibering conjecture. But uh, in any case, he never actually, as far as I know, conjectured it. Um, so um, the, <clears throat> the goal of the talk then is to just explain what, um, what does this question mean? Because I'm assuming that, um, I'm, I'm basically assuming people in the audience have like an um, undergraduate um, math background or maybe some, some classes in mathematics, but um, uh, not, not much more than that. So I want to describe uh, some aspects of manifolds and um, uh, especially the three-dimensional ones, and then um, describe how you, how you manufacture three-dimensional manifolds, different ways you can make them out of lower dimensional spaces, and various other operations. Um, so um, in particular, how to curves and surfaces to make a three-manifold. Um, so basically by products and certain kinds of twisted products called vibrations, and then um, I'll then indicate some of the limitations of this, um, and then um, and then uh, describe Thurston's questions for a, a particular class of, of, of three-dimensional spaces, um, and then I'll at the um, then I'll indicate some of the some of the tools that go into the the resolution of this of this question um, that are outside of the area of three-dimensional topology. Actually, okay, so that's the that's the goal for the, for the talk today. Then. <coughs> Um, so, what is a manifold? Well, it's um, a space, and so by that I mean um, 
a, a metrizable um, topological space. Um, so in, in topology, we're, though, we're not concerned with the metric, um, but um, there's, there can always be an underlying uh, metric on, the, on, the, on this space as we're considering today, and which locally looks like some n-dimensional Euclidean space, and that's called an n-dimensional manifold. So um, here's a sort of standard description. So you have a, a topological space, and you cover it with different patches that look like, that have coordinates, Euclidean coordinates. Um, so on different patches, you'll, you'll get these coordinates, but there might not be global coordinates over the entire space. So, um, <clears throat> but over on the overlaps between these coordinates, you see um, identifications, nice um, what are called diffeomorphisms between the subsets of Euclidean space. So the sort of coordinates might not match up, but, um, but the, um, the derivatives um, and everything is sort of non-degenerate. Derivatives are all non-degenerate, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> so um, you can also, so that's sort of an abstract way of uh, thinking about manifolds. Um, the original way actually they were thought about is as subsets of higher dimensional Euclidean spaces. So if you have a n-dimensional manifold, you, it turns out um, there's an embedding theorem of Whitney that says you can always embed it into um, a 2M dimensional Euclidean space. So it's something, you can think of it sitting like this picture inside of a higher dimensional Euclidean space and it locally um, looks like a, a lower dimensional Euclidean space up to some kind of wiggle. So that's um, sort of a quick <coughs> description of a manifold. If there's any questions, feel free to, to pipe up if, if something's not clear. Okay, so, um, okay, so it's a space then <coughs> covered by um, coordinate charts which have these, which gives a smooth correspondence with the Euclidean space, and um, so I'll be mostly interested in um, today in one, two, and three-dimensional manifolds. So, um, so a, um, a two-dimensional manifold, then you have, you know, coordinates like this, a standard x, y axis, um, and you can think of that as kind of a product, it's a product of a line with a line. So you need two coordinates, each coordinate gives you one dimension, and then the, the um, the pair coordinates gives you a product space. Um, and in three dimensions, then we have three dimensional coordinates locally. Again, there's, you can think of it as a product either of two dimensions with one dimension or of um, three different dimensions. And um, <clears throat> so in some sense, n-dimensional manifolds are made by this kind of products of lower dimensional manifolds. And so the, the kind of goal, I guess, in some sense for the talk today is to see, well, how, how can that product structure, can you extend it sort of globally over the manifold in some sense? I mean, you can't always do that. That's sort of the, the upshot. Um, so, okay, so that's, that's one way of viewing these, these co coordinate charts. Um, okay, so two-dimensional manifolds, let's, let's look at those. These are also called surfaces. And, um, under certain technical hypotheses, bounded, connected, and orientable, then um, they're determined just by the genus. So we have um, two-dimensional sphere. You can think of these as sitting inside a three-space torus, and then connect some. So you can remove disks from two of the manifolds and, um, and glue them together in a uh, connect some operation and make um, as many handles as you like. So um, that's essentially the classification of of surfaces. Um, so um, I, I guess I, also, I skipped over the one-dimensional case. So the only, the only closed bounded one-dimensional manifold is a circle. Um, and um, <clears throat> there's the torus um, is obtained by taking a product of two circles. So um, you can see it here. Um, you, here's sort of global, there's, you can put global coordinates on a, a torus where one coordinate is in one circle and one coordinate is another circle, sort of like lat latitude and longitude. Except the coordinates of latitude and longitude on the Earth, they don't, they're not global in the sense that at the north and south poles, they, they're, um, the, the longitude is not uniquely determined. So there's not some kind of global coordinate system, whereas on the torus there is. And none of these other um, surfaces, higher genus surfaces, can you get some kind of global coordinate system. Um, so, um, so now, 
how do we construct three-dimensional spaces? Um, well, you can construct them from one- and two-dimensional spaces in a variety of ways. Um, so, for example, you can make the analog of this um, torus here. You can make a three-dimensional torus, just product with one more circle, and now you've got a three-dimensional space. Um, I didn't have a picture of that, but um, anyways, hopefully you can imagine that. So, um, <clears throat> so, that's, that's one way, so that's a product construction that gives you a three-dimensional manifold. Um, now, there's a generalization of products which are called bundles. So, um, these are... These are spaces. Th th these are um, spaces where um, the co you don't have a sort of global coordinates, but in, in a certain direction, when you go from one coordinate chart to the another, there's a certain coordinate direction that always lines up, either um, a one-dimensional coordinate or maybe a two-dimensional coordinate if we're in three dimensions. So that's sort of rough description of what a bundle is. So um, a, a classic example is the unit tangent bundle to a surface then this gives you um, a three-dimensional manifold. So I, here's a picture of the two-sphere. And um, at each point, I can draw a little circle. Um, and, and that gives me a third coordinate. So um, I can go to any point, and then I can, there's some angle, a third coordinate um, direction. And this, this gives you a, a three-dimensional topological space. Um, so if you, if we did this on this torus that I had in the previous page, let's see, I guess um, if I do little circles on there, then I would actually just get the three-dimensional torus. It turns out that that's, that unit tangent bundle is actually just a product of the circle. Um, but here it turns out that this, this, theta, this extra coordinates direction sort of doesn't have a global um, consistency like zero. That, another way of saying is there's no, there's no um, section of the, of the unit tangent bundle on the sphere, um, global um, section. So, um, so this is, but yet in, in any given little coordinate patch, um, you can sort of make sense um, of, a, of the third coordinate, the, the third coordinates sort of line up consistently. So that's an example of a bundle. And there's a, it's also a bundle in the sense that there's a map from this three-dimensional space to the two-dimensional space. You just forget the, the angle of the circle. So, um, so that's a, that's a, a rough description of a, of, of a bundle. And um, this is also, the, we can also think of the circles as giving what's called a fibration of the manifold. So um, at every, every point in the manifold, there's a, there's a certain direction that um, is specified by the, the, by the circles um, of, those, of those, unit, <clears throat> those unit tangent circles. Um, anyone know which manifold this is? So I guess this is called um, RP3, the three-dimensional projective space. <clears throat> okay, here's another example of a, of a fiber three-manifold. Um, this yellow um, curve here is the trefoil knot. You think of this inside the three-sphere. And you can extend um, to a, a, a vibration or a foliation by the circles of all of the three-dimensional sphere or the complement of the, of the trefoil knot. So that's another example of a, of a kind of um, foliation or fibration. And if you identify, you, take a, you can take a quotient where you just identify all of these curves to a single point. And it turns out then you get a map um, from the three sphere to the two sphere, um, analogous to the one on the previous page. So, um, so that's another example of, of one of these vibrations, of constructing a three-dimensional space from a kind of twisted product between a two-dimensional in one-dimensional spaces. That's actually, um, but it, it, the terminology for this is it's called a Seifert vibration. So these kind of, um, these were introduced by Seifert and Threffall in the, in the 30s. <clears throat> okay, so what, um, let me go back a step and t say a little bit about topology. So um, <clears throat> topology, the goal is to classify topological spaces up to homeomorphism. This is sort of one of the broad un underlying goals. Um, and um, what does it mean to be homeomorphic? So um, they're sort of topologically indistinguishable. So as I said um, at the beginning, we're considering manifolds as having a metric on them. But in topology, you forget about the underlying metric. Um, and you're, you only care about um, sort of close by points go to close by points. So if you can make a one-to-one -one bijection between two spaces, which 
is not stretching or tearing um, or gluing anything together, then it's a homeomorphism sort of intuitively. So you can make that precise by saying you have um, one-to-one -one bijections between um, the manifolds, which are continuous maps going both ways from, say, x to y and y to x, so that the, if I compose these maps, then I just get the identity map. So that's the, um, the, the technical description of a homeomorphism. Um, but what this means is that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between these two spaces that sends nearby points in one space, in, say, in some metric, to nearby points in another space. Um, and a continuous map is one that takes the preimage of, of balls will um, be a union of the balls in the, in, in the, in the preimage. So, um, okay, so, so that's, that's what we mean by homeomorphism, and so we're interested in, in classifying, in particular, three-dimensional spaces up to homeomorphism. So some classical invariants that, don't, that only depend on the topology um, are orientability, that's basically saying that if, you, if you're living, say, in a three-dimensional manifold and you walk around and you're right-handed, you don't come back to, um, and become left-handed. So that would be a change of orientation. Um, and there's dimension, just the, uh, if it's a manifold, then the dimension of these Euclidean um, coordinate charts that I was just describing, that's a topological invariant. So you can't have a surface that's homeomorphic to a three-dimensional manifold, for example. And then there's uh, things called Betty numbers. In the, again, in the surface case, the Betty number is essentially telling you how many, how many holes you have or what the genus of the, of the surface is in some sense. And then there's a refinement of that called homology. Um, and then the, the fundamental group, which I'll talk a little bit more about. So um, the fundamental group is, is sort of the, one of the most important topological invariants in three dimensions, it turns out, in terms of the, the, class, the, in terms of the homeomorphism classification. So um, <clears throat> now, um, now we know that compact, so it's closed and bounded three-dimensional spaces, they're completely described up to homeomorphism by um, a, a conjecture of, of William Thurston made in the 70s called the geometrization conjecture, and that was solved in um, 2003 um, by Perelman. Um, and this, um, so you might have heard about this, that it implies the Poincaré conjecture, and, um, uh, but it has, it has much, many more ramifications for the study of three-dimensional spaces. Um, now, I'm not going to get into the description of the geometrization theorem today, but um, because we're going to focus um, in, a, in a bit on um, hyperbolic spaces. So, um, so now I've, I described a little bit about fibrations of manifolds by one-dimensional fibers, sort of twisted product construction. But there's, you can also look at fibrations of manifolds with two-dimensional fibers, which are called um, also called foliations. Um, so a three-manifold. Fibers over the circle, if there's a map from the three manifold to the circle where the preimage of every point is a, is a surface, S, which is called the fiber. Um, <clears throat> now, if, if M is, is closed then, um, and fibers over the circle, then the, the fiber will be some genus G surface. We already know the classification of those. And you take that surface and you thicken it up. You just cross it with an interval. So it's a product. Except, so there's nice sort of um, uh, global coordinates here in some sense. But now we glue the top to the bottom by a homeomorphism of that surface. Um, and you, call, you, you get what's called the mapping torus. So another way that topologists make spaces, topological spaces, is via gluing construction. So there's a natural way to, um, to metrize or topologize this when you, um, when you glue up. So you can imagine walking through the space, and as you go through the bottom, you magically appear on the top, kind of like Pac-Man going off the side of the screen and appearing on the other side, if you've ever played that video again. But um, uh, Pac-Man actually lives on a, on a two-dimensional torus, I think. Um, anyways, the, um, so you can imagine uh, making these, these sorts of constructions to get three-dimensional manifolds. And it's a kind of twisted product, because um, you're gluing up here by some homeomorphism. And it turns out that. Um, the homeomorphism, the surfaces, are very rich and complicated and interesting. So um, you get a lot of interesting manifolds this way. So here's another way to think of a, of a foliation. So you can think of um, the, every point in the surface. In the three-manifold, there's a surface going through it. So this is a foliation of a complement of some 
uh, not inside of the three torus that's drawn by, by Ken Baker. I guess, um, I think I have a, a picture here. So that's, um, you can see dynamically the foliation um, is moving, the sheets are moving around each of these um, knots. So this is, the three-dimensional space here is you, you um, it has a, a three-dimensional um, translation symmetry here. So this is, um, and you remove all these rods from the space and it's the component of that has this foliation that's, um, that's in the picture there. So that's um, an example of a, of a fibration. Um, so, um, they're called foliations because I think it evokes, you know, the analogous term in, in geology where you have these, these sort of two-dimensional strata um, that the, the three-dimensional space is made up of. So that's um, one way to think about it. Well, um, so as I was just saying, surfaces have a very rich family of homeomorphisms, um, and um, that, that gives you a, a broad class of three-dimensional spaces this way. Um, which are in some sense made up, you know, um, out of a, a kind of twisted product out of one and two dimensional manifolds. Um, if you took the identity homeomorphism, then you just get the surface crossed with a circle. Uh, but from three, three manifold topologists, that's not usually the most interesting manifold. But, um, but by taking some more non trivial homeomorphisms, you get lots of three manifolds. However, unfortunately, most closed three manifolds are not fibered by, by circles or surfaces. So, um, this is not a very general way of constructing three-dimensional manifolds. Um, so if you fiber over the circle, then it turns out that uh, you're, you have positive first Betty number, which is um, a way of, of saying, well, essentially what it's saying is that this map to the circle um, is topologically non-trivial. There's no way to sort of um, uh, contract it off of the... Um, Continuously, there's no way to what's called homotope it to a point. Whereas if you took a three sphere mapped to a circle, you could um, you could contract that down to a point. So, um, anyways, the um, most three manifolds, in some imprecise sense, though, um, have the first Bayesian number is zero. And so, for that reason, we don't expect we expect most three manifolds, in, um, in some sense, to um, to not be fibered of the circle. Um, and most three manifolds are also usually not foliated by circles, um, like the examples I showed before. Uh, so um, this, the, the, the fundamental groups of these circles turn out to, um, or generic circle, turn out to give uh, um, something in the fundamental group that commutes with every other element, lies in the center, which gives an obstruction to them being foliated by circles. Whereas most three manifolds, again, in some sense, don't have a, a, an element in the fundamental group like that. So, um, if you're familiar with the fundamental group, then hopefully that made sense. Um, but anyway, so, so these, these constructions are nice, but they're not, they're not a very general way of obtaining three-dimensional spaces. Okay, so what I want to talk about then is um, now transition to um, describing hyperbolic manifolds, and then we'll come back to this question about, um, about fibering. So... Um, this is another way, actually, of constructing three manifolds that's involved, that's, that's underlying the geometrization conjecture. So what's hyperbolic space? Well, you can um, imagine it having a table with a chunk of glass in it so that um, the, the, the index of refraction of light is, is proportional to the, to the height above the table. Then, um, then it turns out that, that light will follow a, a geodesic path, which... Um, so in, in a certain metric on this space, where, so if you take, you can take a, a, a distance between two points, it's just the time it takes for light to travel between them. And then light rays will um, either go vertically or they'll go along semicircles that are um, perpendicular to the tabletop. And um, as you approach the table, um, light will slow down and it'll get slower and slower and never actually reach the tabletop. So the tabletop is sort of infinitely far away in this, in, this, in this notion of distance. So um, if you could actually make some, some glass with varying index of refraction, um, in principle, you could look in there and, and get a, an idea of what it looks like in hyperbolic space, which would be kind of cool. <clears throat> so um, 
this gives a kind of physical model for um, upper half space model of hyperbolic free space. Now this has um, a lot of um, isometry. So an isometry of the space is one which takes, um, if it takes two points to two other points, not only is it continuous, but it's, it, it preserves the distance between them, so the, the time that light takes to travel. So it might not be so obvious, but I can, one way, um, so you can think of this as going infinitely far up and, and um, left and right and back and forth. And you can rescale that um, just by um, some factor, and it turns out that that's an isometry. So any of these, if I take this geodesic here and I rescale it, it turns out that light takes the same amount of time to get between two points. You've scaled it so that the points are higher up, but they can move faster up here because light, light moves faster the higher you go. So it ends up being, um, takes the same amount of time to get between points. Um, you have translations, reflections, those are, um, so they're clearly preserved the, the distance. Um, but one that's not so obvious is an inversion through a sphere that's orthogonal to the tabletop. So maybe I'll go to the next page. So if I um, take, take a, a sphere orthogonal to the tabletop and take rays going through there, and I send a point um, at distance r to distance 1 over r outside the sphere, that's called an inversion. And it turns out that that also preserves the, the distance, the, the speed of light in this, um, in this medium. So, um, so the, the upper half space model, hyperbolic space, you can, you can parameterize it by the complex plane. So if you think of the tabletop as um, two parameters, but, but as, a, as a complex number, and then the vertical direction for positive r um, is a third parameter, then, um, then that's upper half space. And it turns out that the, the isometries of the space are given by so-called Mobius transformations, which um, PSL2C, this is two by two matrices whose de complex matrices whose determinant is one. And the P just means that um, you, you might out by plus or minus one. So the action on um, hyperbolic three space is induced by the action on the complex projective plane, CP1, by Mobius transformations of this form. So if I have a two by two matrix, A, B, C, D, then Z goes to AZ plus B or CZ plus D, gives you a, a transformation of this hyperbolic plane here. It might send infinity to somewhere. Um, and that extends over hyperbolic three space. There's a number of ways of doing that using, like, for example, the quaternions. But um, anyway, so that's um, a, a description of the, the isometries of this space. So it's a very rich group. Um. <clears throat> okay, so now um, we say that a, a, a hyperbolic, uh, a manifold emits a hyperbolic structure or hyperbolic metric if there's a, a discrete group, so there's, there's a subgroup of PSL2C, so it's just a collection of matrices closed under taking products and inverses, such that um, M is homeomorphic to um, H3 mod gamma. So what does that mean? Well, H3 mod gamma is just you look at a point in hyperbolic space and you look at all its orbits under this group. So that'll be a set of points sprinkled throughout space, and it's just the, the space of all those points. So if I, if I move those around, um, then you get a, a, a three-dimensional manifold. So you so I identify all those points, if you like. Um, it's a, it's a, another kind of quotient construction. Um, discreteness means that the, these points, these orbits don't accumulate, um, or the, the, the elements of the group don't accumulate at the identity element. So these points stay sort of separated, which guarantees that the quotient space will have a, will admit a metric as well. <clears throat> um, so an example then is um, I can take these two Mobius transformations. So z goes to z plus one. That's just a translation of this um, hyperbolic space. And then there's an inversion here, um, one over e to the two pi over three z plus one. And it turns out so you take these two transformations and you you multiply them together in all possible ways, and it turns out that you'll um, you'll get a discrete set uh, of subset of PSL2C, you quotient by that, and it turns out you get the complement of the figure eight knot. So you can think of this as lying inside of um, the, th the three-dimensional sphere. For a topologist, when they say a knot, we usually mean a closed loop of string. And um, so there's, there's no ends. Um, and you can also think of it as taking a ball um, and having a worm um, eat a hole through it in the, in the shape of the figure eight knot. So, so this thing here is the figure eight knot complement. 
But um, just as a caveat, this is not a compact manifold. The, the, there's no boundary here, actually. So that's sort of off at infinity in, um, in this hyperbolic uh, metric. And there's a way to put a distance. The distance upstairs, the time light travels upstairs, descends downstairs and gives you a, a distance down there. Is there any questions so far? All right. So. Um, some other examples of hyperbolic manifolds. Classic example is the Cypher-Weber dodecahedral space. So I can take a, um, a dodecahedron sitting inside a hyperbolic space, and I can glue opposite sides, as it says here, with a little twist, um, and all in pairs. And it turns out that you, um, you can take a dodecahedron in a hyperbolic space where the dihedral angles are 2 pi over 5, and you end up getting a closed manifold this way. This is a, a compact hyperbolic manifold. So this is one way you can get manifolds is by this kind of gluing construction. And there's an associated group here that has a, a fairly explicit con expression, but um, it's a little harder to write down. Um, as I said, the figure eight knot complement is another example. And then there's the whitehead link complement. So this is, um, again, if I think of this as sitting in the three sphere, take its complement, it emits a, a complete hyperbolic metric. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so, um, so now I've discussed um, several different ways of constructing three-dimensional spaces from lower dimensional spaces in some sense. Um, and all these are um, encompassed under the notion of a vibration or fibering. Um, so they're vibrations where the fibers are either zero, one, or two dimensional. So um, I, I, why, is, why is this, uh, let's go back to this construction. So why is this a, fib a vibration? Well. Um, there's hyperbolic space has a map to this figure eight knot complement, and the preimage of points will be the orbits of this group acting on hyperbolic space. So the preimage of points will be um, a, a discrete set of points in hyperbolic space. So there's a there's a there's a, um, a covering space, in other words, um, where you can get um, the so the hyperbolic space is sort of being wrapped up onto this onto this figure eight knot complement. It's, you can, it's easier to see this in one dimension where you, you can imagine the real line wrapping around the circle. And it's a local homeomorphism. So if I take in a little patch, coordinate patch here, it'll lift to coordinate patches up here. Um, now, if, if the, the cover, if, so if the covering space is contractible, um, it is um, simply connected, I mean, so every loop is contractible in that covering space, then it's what's called simply connected, and it's connected, then the fibers of this vibration comprise the fundamental group. So this is what we saw in the example of the figure eight knot complement. The, the, the fundamental group that I gave acts on hyperbolic space. The orbits are in one-to-one -one correspondence with that group, that sub subgroup of matrices of PSL2C. Um, and that's what, that's what you see in general with covering spaces. So. Um, so this is um, a very general way then to make three-dimensional three-dimensional manifolds, um, and it turns out that hyperbolic three-dimensional manifolds, at least the ones uh, with um, say compact ones, let's say, um, they have what's called residually finite fundamental group. It means they have lots and lots of finite cheated covering spaces. Um, and now again, the geometrization theorem, conjecture theorem. Um, it says that, in some sense, most three-dimensional manifolds tend to be hyperbolic. Again, that's not a very precise statement, but that's sort of, um, uh, it it's, it's, turns out to be a very, very generic way of constructing three-dimensional spaces. Okay, so now let's talk, say what it means, I think I can say what it means to be virtually fibered, finally, and describe what Thurston's question was. So, um, like I said, uh, the figure eight knot and um, whited link complements, they've made a hyperbolic metric, but in fact, they're fibered over the circle. The fiber is actually a compact surface with boundaries. So, or you can think of it as um, a, a surface, like in the figure eight knot case, it's the surface of genus one with, um, but, with, but it's been punctured or it has boundary depending on when you look at a, um, at a manifold, uh, the open one or the, or the one with boundary. Um, similarly, the whitehead link has that property. So we say that a manifold is virtually fibered if there's a finite sheet of cover um, M tilde of M, so that's a finite to one local homeomorphism when these covering spaces, such that M tilde fibers over the circle. Um, so virtually means it's, it's true up to some finite index. Um, virtual is one of those overused terms, but that's uh, what's come to mean in, 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 in topology. So now we, um, Thurston's question, now we've um, 
<clears throat> can describe what it means. So he asks, whatever. every hyperbolic three manifold is virtually fiber. Does it have a fine sheet of covering space which fibers over the circle? So we know that we can't get every three manifold as um, one of these fiber bundles over the circle, so as a twisted product. But this question is saying, well, maybe we get every hyperbolic three manifold by taking these um, mapping to our these um, fiber bundles of a circle, and then quotienting by a finite group of, of symmetries, finite group of isometries. And that, that finite group of isometries, though, will not, it'll, it'll move around these surfaces. These, it's not going to preserve the foliation, so the foliation won't descend downstairs and give us another vibration. So that's the, um, the caveat, I guess. Okay, so now I want to transition to discussing some of the geometry needed to, um, to answer this question. Is there any, any questions again? All right, so, um, so <clears throat> we're going to move to some higher dimensional spaces now. So a cube or um, hypercube um, is just a, a product of intervals. So um, we take um, k intervals. So you can think of this again as there's coordinates here, x1 through xk, where all the coordinates lie between 0 and 1. Here's a picture of a, a four-dimensional cube at, at Caltech, or at least um, the, the one-dimensional skeleton of it. <clears throat> now, um, you can, another way of, as, as I said, of forming topological spaces is by gluing construction. So you can take a bunch of these cubes of different dimensions, and you can glue them together along faces or facets of the cubes. So um, here's a bunch of cubes that have been glued together in various ways. So here's a three-dimensional cube glued along an edge to a two-dimensional cube and glued to a bunch of three-dimensional cubes, et cetera. Um, and so this is what's called a, a cube complex. If, if everything's one-dimensional, then you'll just get a graph. Now, inside a cube complex, there's some special um, <coughs> co-dimension one, um, well, in general, immersed cube complexes, where every... Um, Every cube, there's, a, there's various hyperplanes. So if I set uh, one of these xi coordinates equal to, say, one half, then I get um, a one lower dimensional cube. And I can do that in k different ways if it's a k dimensional cube. And then you can, you can glue all these together to get these um, lower dimensional cube complexes, and they might cross each other because um, the hyperplanes will cross. <coughs> so. Um, so these are, this is called the hyperplane complex, and it, um, these things sort of separate the space into two pieces, which is where, they, um, uh, where the importance or relevance in them come in. So um, Gromov uh, singled out a, a special class of cube complexes called CAD0 cube complexes. Um, and I'll give the combinatorial characterization. The, the, the links of the vertices are called flag simplicial complexes. So um, again, here's some cubes with their hyperplanes. So um, if it's a k-dimensional cube, you'll have k hyperplanes. And as I um, indicated, the, the hyperplanes might not be embedded. So here's one that comes back and self-intersects. So that, um, that'll come up in just a bit. So um, <clears throat> a, a simplicial complex. So a simplicial complex is a complex made out of tetra or, or simplices. Um, and um, it has the property that <clears throat> Um, in, the, in the one skeleton, the, each n plus one complete graph um, is the one skeleton of an n simplex. So you, you can get this from a one-dimensional graph by um, just gluing on simplices wherever you can. Um, so here's, here's an example of a part of a, a, a cube complex. So I, I grew three squares together. These are two-dimensional cubes. And now I chop off the corners around the vertex. So I just chop off the corners of the cube, and I get a bunch of intervals. This is a graph. And here I see a, 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 a K3 graph. So it's a complete graph on three vertices. And that's the one skeleton of a two simplex. So there better be a two simplex filling that in there. But this is actually a, sitting inside of a, a cube complex. So um, that, that two simplex it has to be the corner of a three-dimensional cube. So we better see a three-dimensional cube sitting there. Um, and the, the point behind this that I, I don't really have time to go into, though, is um, there's a kind of positive curvature here. If you think of these as Euclidean cubes with the standard product metric, then there's a kind of concentrated positive curvature at this point. 
And putting a three-dimensional three cube there sort of keeps it non-positively curved in a certain sense, which again, I won't have time to, um, to describe precisely. Now, um, there's a theorem of Micah Segev, who's who was speaking here last week, um, that associates these Katzer cube complexes um, to any set of co-dimension one data spaced with walls. So um, here's an example of a space with walls. So I have, this is the two-dimensional hyperbolic space, and I have a, a family of lines here, which is invariant under the group PSL2Z, um, that's the modular group. And um, each of these lines divides the hyperbolic plane into two pieces. And so um, there's a canonical way that Sagiv um, developed to associate a cube complex to that. So um, where the, the walls here will correspond to the hyperplanes in this complex. So um, each hyperplane here will be associated to a, 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 um, one of these, these lines. And we see triples of lines crossing, and, according, and over here we'll see triples of these hyperplanes crossing. So we've got a three-dimensional cube whenever we have three lines crossing here. These pairs of lines that cross each other, they'll give uh, the squares here. So um, that hopefully gives you um, an idea of how this construction might go. So from a lower dimensional thing in these space with walls, you get a very high dimensional cube complex. But the nice thing about it is that it's much more rigid and it, um, and it satisfies these, uh, this flag condition, that, um, the cat zero condition I described. Um, it's a non, non -posit it has a certain kind of non-positive curvature to it. So um, here's an example of a cube complex of a, that's a surface. So um, here's some walls on a surface. Um, really, I should do this in the universal cover, uh, hyperbol uh, the, the, the hyperbolic plane, and then um, project down. But, um, when you apply his construction to the surface, then you get um, this green. So each, these, these, this green graph on the surface separates the surface into a bunch of squares, and so this gives you a two-dimensional cube complex that's homeomorphic to the surface. Um, okay, so that's an example. Um, and here, notice that each, each of these walls here is embedded. Um, <clears throat> so, um, and this, this cube complex has certain properties that make it, uh, which I'm not going to go into, but it's, uh, um, the key property is essentially that the, the walls here are embedded, that there's some other conditions which make it a, what's called a special cube complex. Um, and I'll, I'll, come back, I'll come back to that um, point in a little bit. So, um, so in uh, 2009, um, Kahn and Markovich proved that any Hyperbolic three manifold, compact closed hyperbolic three manifold contains an essential surface, which is um, nearly geodesic. So, uh, what they proved is that inside a three manifold, um, I'll, I'll, I'll show a picture in a, in, a, in a couple slides of an example of this, but you have um, a surface that maps in, it it's, has self intersections, but it closes up and um, in the, it, it lifts in, the, in, the, in hyperbolic three space to a properly embedded plane that's nearly geodesic. <clears throat> Um, and then from this, shortly after, uh, Bergeron and Wise proved then that any three-dimensional manif hyperbolic manifold, close, compact one, is the, is the fundamental group, it, it's, it's fundamental group, so this, this group gamma that I described before, uh, it's the fundamental group of a cat zero cube complex in a sense. It's most likely going to be very high-dimensional space, so somehow, um, uh, so you apply Sagiv's construction to um, surfaces. So here's a picture of one of these surf circles. This is not one that's nearly geodesic, but an example of a, a kind of circle that, at, at infinity of a hyperbolic surface um, inside of hyper hyperbolic three space that's, um, that descends so, um, to a, a closed surface in the manifold. And um, there's a condition here that if if you have surfaces that separate every pair of points of geodesics, then you can get this, um, this cube complex from Sagiv's construction. So you get these half spaces from surfaces in hyperbolic three space, and then apply Sagiv's construction to get this cube complex. And the cube complex kind of organizes these, these surfaces that are intersecting in a very rigid and um, geometric way. <clears throat> um, and they're far from being embedded in this, in this construction. And that, that implies then that these, these cube complex, so you start with a three-dimensional space and you've made it much more complicated having a very high-dimensional space. But the nice thing is that this high-dimensional space sort of organizes the information of all these um, immersed surfaces. Now, um, 
That's, um, so here's a, a, a picture from the, the cover of, of Bill Thurston's book where you can see the kind of geodesic planes inside of hyperbolic space. So this is the, um, there's a right angle dodecahedron here in hyperbolic three space that's the, um, maybe the fundamental domain of a, of a three dimensional manifold. And this is actually what it would look like to live inside a hyperbolic space. These, um, these curved geodesics you saw in the upper half space model, they actually look straight to your eye because they're, um, there's a plane that goes um, through them. <clears throat> um, or they just thicken up a little bit so they, they look a little bit curved, but, the, the, but they're actually would look, the, a thin line geodesic would look straight to your eye. And um, we have, you can see these sort of two dimensional surfaces and it, um, if you take, if you put a point in each dodecahedron and then take a cube around each vertex, then you end up getting a cube complex that's homeomorphic to hyperbolic three space. Um, and that one, that'll be a cube complex that has the same dimension, but in general, this um, construction will give very high dimensional cube complexes. Um, so then um, in 2008, um, and then based on some um, newer work of, of, y, of Donnie Wise, if you have a three manifold whose fundamental group is the fundamental group of the cube complex where all these hyperplanes are embedded, uh, I think I called them walls here, but I meant hyperplanes. Then the manifold is virtually fibered. It has a finite sheet of cover that fibers over the circles. So um, morally what's happening here is all these immersed surfaces in some covering space, they get organized and cut and paste to give you a nice fiber of a vibration. Um, <clears throat> so uh, that's, um, anyway, so I don't uh, um, have time to go into how that, um, how that correspondence works, but that's, um, that's the, that's the relation now between this high dimensional geometry and the, um, the, the, fi the vibration theorem. <clears throat> um, and it turned out around that, the, the time that this theorem was proved, uh, Haglund and Wise had, had a, a method of producing lots of these cube complexes with these embedded walls. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and it, the, the, the proof makes use of some other three, three dimensional uh, manifold theory called suture manifold theory that's, um, now, um, I talked about hyperbolic three space, and hyperbolic three space you know, has this, this metric distance structure, but that, that distance has a very, some very nice um, properties, namely um, it's um, called a, a, a delta hyperbolic metric space. So um, the, the, the notion of um, originated in hyperbolic geometry. So a, a metric space is, is geodesic if, between any two points, there's a, a line connecting them, which um, is an isometrically embedded interval. So you can get between two spaces, uh, two points in the space by a, uh, um, a line that's um, you know, shortest, shortest um, distance line. <clears throat> then um, we say that a metric space is Gromov hyperbolic. So this is a space with um, a distance function. If um, it satisfies what's called Rips triangle condition. So um, if we have A, B, C points in the space, we connect those three points by geodesics, then um, the geodesic between B and C, which I write with this interval notation here, lies in a neighborhood of d distance delta for a uniform delta about the union of the other two geodesics. So um, here's a picture. Um, so if Euclidean space is not delta hyperbolic. So if I take a, say, equilateral triangle, for any delta you choose, you can take a very large triangle where the union of these two sides, the delta neighborhood, does not contain the third side. So in other words, I can get from B to C without having to stay near the other two sides of this triangle. Whereas if I take a metric space that's a tree, so like a one-dimensional cube complex, Katsura cube complex, then the geodesic connecting A and B goes along here, so I'm restricted to lie along this subspace. A to C goes here, then B, the geodesic going from B to C lies in the neighborhood of these two. So it's actually zero hyperbolic, and that's actually essentially a characterization of, of trees. In hyperbolic space, a triangle, they, have, uh, they are delta hyperbolic. So if I take two edges here, and then the third edge, you know, the ray of light going between here and here is going to travel within delta of this right light ray, and then it's going to move over to this one and travel along there. So in fact, um, hyperbolic space is log of one plus root two hyperbolic <clears throat> in, this, in this sense. 
Okay, so now um, it turns out that these cube complexes constructed by Bergeron and Wise, they have a fundamental group equal to the three manifold group. Their, um, their universal cover, this simply connected covering space, um, will be delta hyperbolic for some delta. So, um, <clears throat> so now I can um, state um, this uh, conjecture that, that Wise formulated in, in 2011 which implies the virtual fibering conjecture. So what he conjectured is that if you have a compact Katsuo cube complex whose universal cover has a delta hyperbolic metric for some delta, then um, there's a finite sheet of cover of it with embedded hyperplanes. Now, um, <clears throat> we've gone from three-dimensional hyperbolic manifolds to these high-dimensional delta hyperbolic spaces um, and it turns out that this sort of generalization is, is crucial to the proof, that there's um, a lot more structure to these, this broader category that can be taken advantage of in, in, in improving this sort of thing. Um, and the, the fact that it's delta hyperbolic here is crucial. So there, it turns out that there's, there are Katsuo square complexes, in fact, two-dimensional complexes, which don't have any finite sheet of covering spaces, constructed by Berger and Moses. So um, this this delta hyperbolicity is crucial here, and it comes from the kind of hyperbolic um, structure uh, that's, um, that the three-manifold has. And so, um, so then the corollary of this is that if you have a, a three-manifold, a compact three-manifold like this cipher weber dodecky space, then um, it'll have a finite sheet of cover that fibers of a circle, so the, resolving that question. Um, now, the proof makes use of a lot of the, te the technology that Downey Wise developed. Um, and uh, in particular, um, the Mount Normal Special Quotient Theorem and work that um, he did in collaboration with Haglund and Shu. And also a, a, a big part of the um, work depended on um, some of my joint work with um, Daniel Groves and Jason Manning, who's here this week, um, and their technique. We use a technique they call um, relatively hyperbolic Dane filling, which again, I don't have time to go into, but it's, um, so there's a, 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 a huge amount of sh machinery that, that I made use of in, um, in this. Uh, I don't really have time to, de to describe the proof, but the rough idea is that you take this cube complex and you take all the hyperplanes in there and you chop the cube complex along these hyperplanes. You take a number of copies of the cube complex, you chop them up into these little pieces, and then you reassemble them in a non-trivial way inductive way to get um, this finite sheet of covering space that we wanted, which had it all embedded hyperplanes. Um, but it's a very delicate thing to do, and so I, I don't really have time to, to go into the description of that. Um, and, um, <clears throat> but anyways, that's just to give you a, a flavor of, um, of, of what's going, of how, how this works. Um, so now I'll, I'll just mention one open question that's, um, uh, that it's, is active um, area of research now that's some of the tools developed here are useful for. So the question is, um, if you have two hyperbolic free manifolds, you have their fundamental groups, these um, two by two matrix groups. Um, because they're matrix groups, they actually have lots and lots of uh, finite quotients, and you get them from the, this, this theorem as well. Um, now, um, these three manifolds, it turns out, their homeomorphism type is determined by the, um, the fundamental group. So, um, then you can ask, are, if, if two of these three manifolds, if they have all the same finite quotients of their fundamental group, then are they actually homeomorphic to each other? This is kind of a classical way, um, classical invariant in topology. So topologists distinguish various knots by looking at so-called knot colorings, which is a way of describing a certain kind of dihedral representation of a knot group. And if you have a, a knot that has a coloring and none that doesn't, then they can't be the, um, the same knot, for example. Or you're really talking about the homeomorphism type of their complements. So that's um, so the classical way of distinguishing three-dimensional manifolds. And so um, there's been some progress on this. So um, <coughs> uh, Brideson, Reed, and um, Wilton, and Boileau, and Boyer show that the figure eight knot complement fundamental group um, is determined among three manifold groups by its finite quotients. And then uh, actually they proved this for many other classes of manifolds of a similar flavor, um, th certain uh, manifolds of fiber uh, punctured torus. And the, the vibration plays an important part here in the um, consequences of these, these kind of theorems I was describing. So um, I'll, I'll stop there.
Thank you very much again for a nice talk. Questions? Yeah, of course. So what if you have uh, this three-manifold fiber over a circle? Is there some measure of complexity of this three-manifold? For instance, I mean, higher genus fibers means maybe more complex. And can you sort of list them by in order of increasing complexity? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So um, there's an invariant of three manifolds um, that's um, uh, the, the, the vol hyperbolic three manifolds have a volume. It's actually a topological invariant, again, because this metric, it turns out, is essentially canonical up to um, isometry. So, um, so that's, that's one complexity. But it turns out that there's certain three manifolds, like even the whitehead link that I uh, put up earlier, that they fiber, but they fiber in infinitely many ways. And the, the fibers can be arbitrarily large genus. So, um, so you could have like a complexity that's like the minimal genus of a fibration. That's, um, and there's other kinds of invariants, so-called dilatation and various things that you can, that you can extract from, from these fiberings. But yeah, that's, um, there's a variety of ways to, that that question can be answered. More questions? Yeah. No. Do higher dimensional hyperbolic manifolds also have this vibration structure, or is there something special about a three-dimensional hyperbolic manifold? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So um, it it turns out that um, higher dimensional hyperbolic manifolds they 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 can't like I say a four-dimensional hyperbolic manifold it can't fiber. Uh, in a way where the where the fibers are nice and let's say hyperbolic three manifolds, um, there's there's weaker versions of fibration. That, uh, so actually, recently, um, Donnie Wise and some collaborators, I think uh, one of the collaborators is here. I think uh, they they showed that uh, certain four dimensional hyperbolic manifolds they have a the fundamental group has a map to Z where the kernel is finitely generated, which is what you have in this fibration case. Um, the there's a map induced by the map to the circle, which on the fundamental group maps to Z, and the kernel is the fundamental group of the surface, which is finally generated. So that's maybe the only weakest analog we have so far. But it, I would say most likely not. Um, or anyway, so, so that's um, uh, three dimensions is very special in that way, so be, be, because the surfaces have a rich group of homeomorphisms, where it turns out that three manifolds um, have much more restricted um, homeomorphism, classes of homeomorphisms. Uh, in particular, hyperbolic free manifolds, the, uh, the diffeomorphism is modular isotopy is only finite group, a set of isometries. So you can't really get a, a, a hyperbolic four manifold out of a fibration, fortunately. More questions? Probably on this side of the. <laughs> yeah, Michelle. Say again. I guess that even dimensional hyperbolic manifold cannot fiber over the circle because the other characteristic is non zero. You have uh, this churn veil. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. So yeah. this, that's so this open for odd dimensional, I guess. Right. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's a better answer to the question. That's a question by Gromov, in fact. Right. So, um, if, you, if you fiber the circle, then the OI characteristic is zero, whereas. Um, yeah, Chern, Chern gauss binet theorem says that the, the hyperbolic volume of the four manifolds is proportional to the Euler characteristic. So it has to be non zero. Yeah, that's, uh, I should. More questions? When other people think about the question, let me ask you. At some point, you said that the most three dimensional manifolds have a. First betting number equal to zero. Uh, how can you? Yeah. Count? Okay. Yeah. So that's only a heuristic statement. There's um, you can make that precise with certain models. So um, <clears throat> three manifolds have a description in terms of Heegard splitting. You can de decompose them in two two handle bodies, and um, one consequence of that is that they have a presentation for the fundamental group with the same number of generators as relators. So you take a free group. K, K generators, and then you, you, you kill K different elements and take the, the smallest, you know, uh, the largest quotient group of that. Um, and so generically, you expect that those K um, 
relators will, will kill the homology of that free group. Um, and so that's one, one way in which that can be made precise. Um, but anyways, um, there's, there's also censuses of these three manifolds. You take tetrahedra, you glue them get together in all ways, and you see which hyperbolic manifolds you get, for example, or other manifolds. And again, most of them just experimentally seem to have first Bayes number equal to zero. So um, that's why you have to pass to a finite cover before you get hope to have a fiber, a fiber bundle. Please. Yeah. Is there anything else you can learn about the three manifold from looking at this cube complex you've associated to it? Uh, yeah, any other thing you can learn about the three manifold? Yeah, there's a lot more. Um, so there's what's called um, uh, local extended residual fineness or subgroup separability. So um, the way that, <clears throat> that um, well, <clears throat> what, what that says is that these surfaces, for example, these Kahn-Markovich surfaces, there's always a finite sheet of cover where they can lift to an embedding. Um, so that's one consequence of, of this cube complex, or rather the special cube complex structures. They have this um, nice, nice property of uh, subgroups. Um, there's, yeah, there's other, <clears throat> other consequences, so-called goodness of the, the fundamental group, that the, um, the, the cohomology is sort of detected, uh, the, uh, the three-manifold group is sort of detected by its finite, finite quotients of the fundamental group. And that, that plays into... I mean, that's not really directly, that's it's sort of indirectly related to the cube complex structure, more related to the fibration. <clears throat> the question? <clears throat> okay, so before we finish, let me just uh, remind you that, uh, oh, as, as useful for colloquia, uh, oh, there's a question there. Oh, yeah. Hi, I don't know much about uh, that things, but I have just a question. Is there any physical implementation of this question number 18 or not? Again, the physical impl implementation of what? To the again? physical world, to my world, I don't know. I mean some um, <clears throat> physics. Oh, yeah, okay, so, um, so one, I, I guess, okay, so examples of uh, three manifolds um, in physics, is that what? Basically, what you're asking. So, you know, we live in a three-dimensional space together with time. So, you take a, a cross section of our universe, and it's a three-dimensional space, and we don't know if it goes on forever or if it might close back on itself, like the surface of the Earth. Um, <clears throat> it was a you know hypothesis, I guess, maybe in the in the '90s that um, maybe our universe is is finite, and um, now we know how to list all those finite manifolds. But now we look at WMAP data, and it looks looks like there's no indication of any kind of topology there that we can signature that we can see yet. Um, <clears throat> so, um, but that would be that would be a killer application, you know, if we knew that the three man that what the three manifold homeomorphism type of our universe was. That would be that would be interesting. Um, <clears throat> there's other applications in um, uh, in study of knots, DNA, bacterial DNA can form closed loops, and um, it turns out that. So studying knots is a is a sort of relative version of topology where you have a you're allowed to deform the knot but it can't pass through itself. But it turns out that the the homeomorphism type of the knot complement is a nearly complete invariant of that knot. So you, uh, there's a lot of these things. There's like effective algorithms. So you have um, two you could have two knotted strands of DNA and you can plug them into this program called Snappy and it can tell you are they the same or not, for example. So there's um, I don't know how much these things have been applied, but a lot of the techniques are applied in, in some theoretical sciences in various ways. So I think this is a, so let me finish my, my sentence before. So it's a, as a, every colloquia, we have the refreshments outside. So everybody's welcome to join us to have some refreshments, except for the diploma students who will come here and then ask questions to, to the speaker for the next few minutes. And with, the promise that they can have some food after. <laughs> okay, so let's then uh, eat again. <laughs>